This is Think for Yourself, an introduction to critical thinking. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video series, we're looking at some of the basic rules for sound um, thinking and good critical thinking skills. Um, we're follow if you'd like to follow along with us, we're using a workbook for arguments by David Morrow and Anthony Weston. Um, so welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. If you've been following along in the video series, you know that we've been looking at um, how one should approach and evaluate or even make generalized claims, generalizations. And keep in mind here that we've talked about the idea that generalizations are part and parcel to the the to living life and describing our experiences. So generalizations can or can often take a very negative tone. Uh, but remember, we are always generalizing. So the question is, what makes a good generalization from a bad one, and how should we? What are some of the good rules we should use when we're looking at generalizations? For instance, we looked in Rule Seven is that you should always use. There should always be more than one example to support a generalization to support to support a general generalized claim. So, for instance, if you say that all Christians pray, right, then you need to give more than one example. Um, that that's the case. And for instance, it's likely that at least most Christians pray, and so there's lots of evidence for that, um, at least as a generalization. Rule eight was that when examples are used, those examples should be representative. So you need to look for representative ex examples to support a generalization. Oh, pardon me. And we also, in, in, the, in the last video, we looked at the idea that background rates are also pretty important because if we're going to understand a generalization, especially when we're talking about the frequency of things occurring, you have to know what's normal in order to understand um, whether or not a generalization holds. I'm not going to go through that, but you can take a look at the video series uh, that, we, that we looked at last time and that's posted as a part of the playlist here. Let me see if I can move this over. Okay, so what are we looking at today? Today is Rule 10. The idea is that statistics need a critical eye. Now, I, I just sort of put a little picture up here, but we all know that when, when we see statistics, they can take on this aura of being certain and definite. And a lot of times, uh, when people begin to cite statistics, most people become disarmed intellectually. That is, most people... A, lot, a common reaction is be like, okay, well, you obviously know what you're talking about, so your 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 idea, your argument must make sense. And of course, we know that's not the case. Um, and part of the reason here is that we need to clarify. Whoops, um, it helps to clarify here what exactly statistics are. Now, these definitions are not definitions that I've gotten from the American Statistical Association or something like this. But I think in general, these definitions hold. So. This is not a statistics class, just to be clear. Uh, but I think we can begin by differentiate statistics as a science versus a statistic. That is, a lot of times when we're reading an argument, people will cite a statistic. They give reference to a statistic, or they'll make a, a, a proposition. You know, for instance, they may say that 88% of doctors polled prefer Crest toothpaste, right? Well, that's not statistics as a science, right? That's a, basically a generalized description for a sample group or population that's been polled, right? And there's a lot of questions here about what goes into this number. And then there's also the question of whether or not a statistic, a given statistic, is relevant to an argument that it's about. Um, now, statistics as a science, of course, concerns the collection, the analysis, the interpretation, and the presentation of data. So you can think of statistics as a science that uses mathematical modeling, though statistics is not itself the same thing as mathematics. So statistics uses mathematical modeling uh, for its methodology of analyzing groups and analyzing the, the range and the way in which groups function over time given certain sorts of parameters. Right now, but there's some of the things that you want to look for when you see a statistic. Um, for instance, whenever you see percentages, remember that anything can be put into a percentile form, because um, all you have to do to get a percentage, right, is divide um, divide a number by um, divide the numerator um, by the denominator. So a percentage, right? If you, so, when we see percentages. You, a good statistical reference should include the absolute numbers that are actually represented by the statistic. So, for instance, if someone says that 28, if like imagine if I told you 90% um, 
Or imagine if I said 100% of my neighbors polled said that they do not have a problem with me having a huge party all night long. Um, but the thing is, I only asked one person. So while this, the statistic would be true, 100% of the people polled, without having an absolute number, then it's hard for you to know what the statistic is actually about. And also to understand um, the extent to which it's relevant to the, the, the thing that's being studied. Uh, or being discussed, right? So you got to watch out for percentages to a certain degree, uh, and you want to look for solid, real numbers that so that way you can understand what the percentages actually do mean. Um, over precision, um, a lot. Sometimes authors can use statistics in a manner which is too precise. That is, um, sometimes people might extrapolate ideas from statistics um, in which their conclusions are overly precise. And they don't actually they don't actually represent reality. They just represent the mathematics, uh, the, a mathematical extrapolation. So, and sometimes authors will put lots of statistics in there to make it sound like it's precise, but that doesn't mean it's actually a good argument or that it's true, right? You always have to remember that statistics are numerical generalizations. Whoops, that's misspelled. I apologize, right? Statistics are numerical generalizations, right? Remember that. When you, in order to construct a statistic about a group or a given sort of, in the most simple sense, if I'm studying something, let's say I'm just polling my neighbors and I want to know who likes Pepsi and who likes Coke, right? So I go to all my neighbors, or I go to a uh, just a set. I go to I go to all my neighbors' doors. Not all of them are there. I'm actually only able to get eight out of ten neighbors to respond to my survey, right? So you can see there is now I have a sample. Right. And then I can say, you know, it happens to be the case that 75 percent of those remaining neighbors prefer Coke to Pepsi or something like this. So you can see here is that when I then go and say, guess what? The the um, statistical majority prefer Coke. Right. If that's the only knowledge I have, then I don't really know what we're talking about um, and to what extent it actually applies. So remember, statistics are numerical generalizations. Right, and that means that simply because a statistic is cited doesn't mean it's true. It depends on how a statistic is generated, how the information, the data points are collected. Right, it also depends upon the categorization of the data collection. I used to work at a, an office of institutional research at a university in New York, and one of the things I noticed very, very quickly is that most people have really a terrible time trying to understand the meaning of statistical um, of statistical tables or statistical graphs and charts. It can oftentimes be very difficult. You have to remember these are numerical generalizations um, developed out of some modeling. Oftentimes they're presented as percentages, um, which can easily mislead, but on the other hand, are extremely useful in terms of identifying trends. But we have to also be careful when we talk about trends, because um, a trend can be constructed when the person who accumulates the, the statistics, the data, juxtaposes things in a certain way. So you have to be careful here when trends are, are articulated. Another thing that's important to recognize when you're looking at statistics is to keep, to keep separate the notion of description and interpretation. For instance, one of the things I've found is that when people go to make charts and they go to title their charts, Oftentimes, they'll title their charts with the interpretation of the information rather than a description of it. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can easily infer when we're given charts and things like this or when people cite statistics, um, especially in the case of making generalized claims about things, right, like groups of people. Um, think about here when they talk about the opinion polls. What does the American people think or what do the American people think about Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton or something like this or Obama? Right, um, And then what they do is they sample the population, extrapolate it, put it into a mathematical model, and then represent it. And then people begin to draw and interpret, draw um, conclusions, and they begin to interpret that information. But remember, all of that is just a generalization. It's not actually, there is no will of the American people. There's only wills, the will of Americans. So um, the American will, when it's represented statistically, you have to remember it's a generalization. Another thing to remember here is the difference between causation and correlation. Um, correlation is when two things, 
seem to go together in terms of when the data is collected or something like this. Right? So for instance, you can sometimes see a statistical graph where you'll see two things which seem to where one thing occurs and then another thing drops or something like this. And it looks like there's a causal relationship between two two trends or something like this or two events that you can find in the data. But just because they're correlated doesn't mean that one is actually causing the other to occur. So when people talk about statistics and also when they um, begin to cite statistics in order to talk about how what the one thing is causing another thing, think here for instance about debates about education system and how test performance scores and all this sort of stuff and money. Uh, frequently you'll see Right, some school districts spend more money and they have a higher um, success rate. So, is it the case that the money causes the success, or is it just that it's correlated? Um, it's pro likely just correlated. Um, so, those are some things that you want to keep a lookout for when you're actually doing these, when you're actually looking at statistics, and, and also rendering your own conclusions from statistical evidence, um, which is which is solid thing to do. Right, a good thinker does in fact um, understand statistics and this sort of thing. So what are some of the other things to keep in mind is samples. Remember the sample is who gets polled and you want that sample to be big enough that it's actually representative. Usually a thousand persons is usually pretty good in terms of having pretty good samples. But you want to make you want to watch out for a bias sample, right? Samples that have the samples that are chosen in which you don't have objective data, right? You, the the results or the conclusion or certain elements are get baked into the sample and into the problem. So you want non-biased samples. You generally want randomized samples. And you also also consider the sampling error, right? For instance, if you're ever looking at a newspaper in, in a, po a political poll, for instance, is cited, if it's a, if it's a reputable poll, then what will happen is they will include the sampling error. They'll say plus or minus five percent or something like this. So right, they will identify to what degree their mathematical model is predicted to actually be accurate. right? So that's a really important thing to look for. And that's also important that when you're writing a paper, if you ever cite a statistic, you should include that kind of information in a footnote or something. Um, also keep in mind the difference between the meaning of average. We use the term average a lot, um, especially when we're talking about groupings. But remember that there's three different things that that can refer to. <coughs> Excuse me. On the one hand, you have a mean. The mean is the arithmetical average, um, and that is essentially, um, you know, you take all the numbers and then you divide them by the number of count um, that you have. So you take all the values. So if you have 50 uh, baseball players and you want to figure out what their average home run score is, right? Then you add up all their scores and then divide them by the sum of all the individuals who are counted. This is known as the mean. That's like the that's what most people probably think of when they think of average, right? But sometimes when people talk about the average, they might be talking about the median. The median is the midpoint of the data set, right? So if I have, uh, let's say I have uh, my highest value baseball player got 10 home runs and my, my, uh, and my, my worst baseball player got zero home runs, right? So that would mean that the median is five home runs, right? And, and the median is not necessarily tied to there being an individual ex who expresses the median, right? The median is a mathematical midpoint in the data set. There's also the notion of the mode, right? And the mode refers to the values that occur with the greatest frequency. Um, so, sorry about that little spelling error. Um, uh, typo there, right? But that's what the mode is, right? So the mode is um, the values that occur the most, right? And there's a way to calculate the mode. So when people begin talking about averages, it's good to try to understand what kind of average they're actually talking about. Um, other important concepts, remember the range. The, some of this comes from statistics, and so if you haven't taken statistics, you might want to watch a sort of follow-up video to this on basic statistics, right? But this, most people have seen this stuff. Range is the difference between the largest and the smallest value in the data set. The variance is how much every data point varies from the mean. And then the standard deviation, which is frequently given when statistics are presented, for instance, or published. Um, this, and the standard deviation tells you 
how far away from the mean uh, are these values? And the standard deviation ultimately is determined by uh, the square root of the variance, right? Now, some other things here to, to keep in mind here is statistical graphs. A lot of times when you see graphs, they might not be drawn to scale, right? So one of the things to question here is to look at is are the axes of a graph actually to scale with each other? Sometimes you can misrepresent data by skewing the axes. Think, for instance, if you see bar charts and they've been stretched, for instance, it may look bigger, right, than it really actually is expressing, right? Um, is the graph complete? For instance, is half of the chart missing, right? You're, you're, so for instance, if you're um, in a chart, uh, one thing you can easily do is if you go into Excel, you can create a table to show your, to, as an example of this. You can have, for instance, three data sets, three data points, which are only just a couple. Let's say you have three baseball players. One baseball player um, got two home runs. The next one got six home runs. And then the last one got 12 home runs, right? Now, if you put those next to each other, it's going to, if you put those on two next to a chart with a regular axis, then it's going to look like they're, you know, just slightly different from each other. But if you zoom into the graph, for instance, and only show the top of the graph, then you're going to look, it's going to look like one of the, um, of the baseball players, the one with the low number got virtually none where the others have high gains. And what happens there is that the way in which the, the, the axes of a graph, a statistical graph are scaled can skew the perception that the reader has of the graph, right? And so you have to watch out for that kind of stuff. Is the graph complete? The other thing is pictograms versus charts. You can, oftentimes statistical information and, and generalized information is represented in charts. Sometimes you get pictograms. What's a pictogram? A pictogram, for instance, is when they want to represent something um, by using pictures, right? So imagine, for instance, if I want to show you how, um, how much oil there is that's shipped into the United States, and I'll have one, I'll have a little picture of a, of, a, of a barrel of oil, and that represents a thousand barrels of oils, and then I'll stack them up, and then I'll take how many they have in England, and I'll stack those up, and we can compare them. You have to be careful with those. Sometimes the way in which the pictures are actually drawn can skew the interpreter, can skew the interpretation by the reader. Usually if you see pictograms, you shouldn't trust them. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, the last thing here I'll mention about percentages is watch out. People should never add percentages, um, at least not unless the percentages have the same denominator. Um, keep in mind that a percentage is given by the numerator and the denominator, uh, multi dividing the numerator by the denominator. But sometimes what happens is a percentage, let's say, um, let's say that in my neighborhood, I want to see how many people are going to dress up for Halloween, right? And let's say I have... 10 neighbors, I talk to all 10 of them, and all of them are going to dress up for Halloween. You go to your neighbors, right? But in this case, you only go to five neighbors, and all of them are going to dress up for Halloween. So for instance, I could say 100% of my neighbors are going to be dressing up for Halloween. You could say 100% of your neighbors are dressing up for Halloween. We can't add the percentages and say, therefore, that we have 200% of people. 200% <laughs> of our neighbors are going to be uh, dressing up for Halloween. You can only add the absolute numbers here. So watch out. Sometimes people will begin to add percentages, right? They'll say, we made 15% gain in test scores this year, and then we did another 10% gain here. And they'll start listing these things off and then trying to add them together. That is not rational. So watch out for that kind of stuff. The base of this percent should always be stated. And of course, always watch out. There's always numerical errors, right? This kind of stuff is common. Okay, so so I've probably gone too far because you're going to see if you're following on the book. The book is mainly concerned um, not so much with looking at charts and graphs, but really just thinking about the use of the statistic, right? So, for instance, take this argument and ask yourself, what's wrong with this argument? I would encourage you to pause the video, read it, and think about it, right? But here's what it says. Cigars containing, I'm sorry, cigars contain... 200 different types of carcinogens. That's 100 more than is contained in a bottle of insecticide. Therefore, smoking cigars is even stupider than drinking a bottle of insecticide. You can see we've got some more spelling, spell check errors there. Um, right? But hold on, wait, let's think about this. What's the argument again? They're saying that cigars have 200 different types of carcinogens. 
And they're saying that's more types of carcinogens than there are in a bottle of insecticide. So therefore, smoking cigars is worse than drinking a bottle of insecticide. Well, let's think about that, right? What's the problem here? Well, the first problem here is you notice a number is cited, so it gives it this sense that, okay, this is something official, this is certain, right? But notice that they're not containing the same things, and also the potency is not necessarily clear, right? Uh, so think, right, just because there's 200 different types of carcinogens in tiny amounts doesn't mean that that's um, less dangerous than drinking a bottle of insecticide that only has, let's say, 100 different types of carcinogens, but with the higher concentration. So you can see here that what's happening in this, this silly example that I've misspelled a couple words is that you're trying to compare 200 types of carcinogens in cigars with something that's not comparable necessarily. Uh, because especially for the conclusion that you'd be stupid to smoke a cigar, you'd be smarter to drink a bottle of insecticide, right? You can see here that the numbers actually begin to confuse us in terms of what we're comparing. And also what's relevant for comparison. Just the number of carcinogens isn't necessarily as important as say for instance the intensity and the toxicity of those carcinogens, right? So there's more things that go into this than just making than just the number of carcinogens. So be careful here. This is an example where the numbers can give it this sense of being a good argument when it's not really. Okay. Anyway, that's where we'll end for today, and that's the rule ten. Statistics need a critical eye. Thank you guys very much for watching. This has been Think for Yourself. Uh, introduction to critical thinking. See you guys online. Bye.